The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Welcome back to the Retro Rangers podcast. I am your host, George Grimm, and I'm pleased to welcome back to the, to the podcast my, my friend um, and author, a ranger historian, Sean McCaffrey. Sean, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, George. How- Sean? Hi, you hear me? I hear you now, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. How have you been? Good, good. Looking forward to this. Okay, Sean just uh, just uh, recently released his fourth book about the Rangers. It's called uh, The Top 100 Million Villains of New York Ranger History, The, the Worst Ranger Killers of a Century. Um, I read it and I loved it and I and I I thought it was great and I wrote a review about it and I thought I'd have Sean on the show with me to to, um, to talk about it. The book brought back a lot of not so fond memories, but it was good. It was it was interesting to read. Um, uh, how about the um, the uh, the inspiration of the book? What uh, what made you write the book? I had a couple ideas for different books before writing this one, but after the uh, 2023 Stanley Cup playoffs, I wanted to write something uh, humorous while being funny at the same time with with misery. So with the Devils' uh, comeback win, I was like, man, it's just another example of Ranger Killers of my lifetime. I said, you know what, this is the book I should do is Ranger Killers. I'll put my own twist on it, do something different, and I'll get back to writing something more serious for my next project. But for this one, I just wanted to do something where we could all commiserate together and laugh as one. Right. All right. So it um, it uh, probably all came about last spring, right? Yeah. Well, I had the idea in my mind, but it was kind of something I had on the shelf. Like I said, once that uh, loss happened, I was like, you know what? This is this is the project. This is the uh, the cards falling in place, because this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of um, enemies in there, a lot of the Islanders, a lot of New Jersey Devils. Uh, have you ever uh, counted up to see which team has the most villains? Uh, Islanders. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, you could, you could, you could put a put a whole team of uh, Islanders together from the people in the book. Yeah. Um, if I just did the uh, entire fly, uh, you know, if I listed the Broad Street Bullies individually, you know. Yeah. Okay. Have you gotten any feedback? Uh, from oh anybody? yeah. Outside of your review, which was amazing, and I thank you for that. Uh, the review has been uh, overwhelmly positive, and people are like just saying this, you tackled the tough subject and you made it funny and you know entertaining and everything like that. So. Uh, yeah, everyone's seem, everyone who's bought it seems to really enjoy it. Good, good. You know, as 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 um, um, uh, all the research that you did was really impressive. I mean, you go back to King Clancy. Now, uh, I have two memories of King Clancy myself. One was when uh, the Rangers were on Channel Nine on Saturday nights in in the Toronto, and Bill Chadwick used to interview King Clancy, and they used to have a lot of laughs together because they both were referees together in the league. And then um, when Vic Hadfield threw, uh, uh, threw a Prohance mask into the crowd uh, in the playoff game, uh, whatever year that was, King Clancy led a search party uh, into that area of, of uh, Madison Square Garden down by the glass looking for the, um, the mask. But by that time, it was it was probably out of the garden, and uh, or at least up in the blue seeds anyway. But um, which, which is you know, funny. You go all the back, all the way back to King Clancy and and uh, and uh, Tiny Thompson. It's amazing. Yeah, and which is funny is because um, after the whole King Clancy thing, then you had the whole thing with Boston and Mike Milbury and Terry O'Reilly. So it seems as if something yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the crowd in there, you know? Yeah, shoe boy. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of uh, 
a lot of interesting uh, episodes in there. You you know you don't you don't think of them. Uh, um, you know, one, you know, one by one. But then, when you get them all together in in a book form, you realize that there's there's been a lot of um, a lot of episodes like that with the Rangers and a lot of um, Ranger killers over the year. I mean, on you know, on on the ice. I mean, as far as scoring goals and uh, you know, winning games that way, and as far as um, beating Rangers up and uh, trying to to uh, Intimidate them, and it's just there's been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, other teams who have uh, done that to the Rangers, and um, I I don't I really can't think of many times the Rangers did it to other teams, but I guess there are we just don't pay attention. But I guess uh, I guess you know if other teams were were uh, were making a list of um, killers for their team, some of the Rangers would be on there. I guess. I'm sure, I'm sure that Vancouver Canucks would have like Mike Richter and uh, Mark yes. Messier. You know, and then yeah. uh, I guess as far as recent memory, maybe the Carolina Hurricanes would have Henrik Lundqvist there because I believe he has some amazing record against them during that, that whole era. But <laughs> it's not that Rangers history is really not too positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we have a good long history, but, you know, some of it just isn't so good. But... Um, um, how about the uh, top current Ranger killers, you know, active players? Oh, well, obviously, I, I think Sidney Crosby I have ranked the highest there. But I think yeah. he, I believe he was three overall. I think he's fairly ranked of all the damage he's done to them over the years. Um, one Ranger killer who I respect was uh, Alex Ovechkin, who, you know, grade eight, I have him ranked at number eight in the book. Um, yeah. And yeah. Well, newer ones, you know, like Akira Schmidt and uh, Jack Hughes, who you couldn't ignore as to what, uh, what happened recently. And then you have a couple uh, longer tenure guys throughout the league, like a Matt Martin from the Islanders or Wayne Simmons for his days with the Flyers. So I think I covered I try to cover every year and every generation in the book. Hmm. Yeah, you did. You did, you know, good job. I, I had mentioned to you about putting John Ferguson at number 100. Uh, but um, you know, different different enemies for different eras. I mean, um, my my era, um, he would have been way up there because he, he he you know he's a great player. I really respect him as a player, but he really really uh, you know did a lot to hurt hurt the Rangers over the years and Ted Green. But um, you know, it's you know different eras and. Um, the enemies of your era are not the enemies of my era. So. Exactly. And that's mentioned in the book how no one's gonna, even if we have a list of two people, no one's going to agree on anything, you know, even if it's just somebody that's two people, which is why I even wrote in the book, like different players from different generations are going to hit everybody differently. So try to hit, I try to make it as best as I could, but obviously people are going to have their own opinions, and that's fine. Yeah. You know, this is one of those, you know the bad guys are on the list, and I, I really can't think of anyone who you missed. I was surprised at some of the people that you remembered, but um, I I can't think of anyone you missed. So um, it was a good effort. It was um, a really interesting read. No, I appreciate uh, what's, um, any idea what's next? What are you writing next? I have three things going on my mind, but I haven't. Uh... I have uh, the skeleton outline done, but I haven't really gone full bore with it. Uh, one is Rangers Fight Club, and that would be taking a look at every single fight in Rangers history, who won, who lost, you know, stuff like that, and try to make it entertaining. The second idea I have is uh, D-Day, and it'll be every book about uh, every uh, – it'll be a book covering every trade, that, uh, every draft that the Rangers ever had, who they drafted, who they passed on, what happened afterwards, what could have happened, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, um, that'd be interesting, yeah. And then the other one is a personal project I want to do called Rickard. And it would be a uh, biography about Tex Rickard from his perspective. And obviously I'd have to take a little creative liberties with that, trying to, you know, try to imagine all quotes he had. But I was trying to make it – there's an autobiography he, uh, out there on him. So I was trying to use that as an outline. But it's something I haven't – I have to go really full bore with and uh, really examine it before, before actually publishing it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Good. You, know, you, you, you have to have plans, and you gotta, 
you got to know when something's working for you and when it's not, you know. And exactly. you got to be ready to back off and try something else. Because uh, I really think if, uh, if more people who knew who were aware of Rickard, I think if I could write it to the best of my ability and get it out there, his life is like Deadwood, Deadwood meets Boardwalk Empire meets Yellowstone. I mean, the guy did everything. He ran, and he's kind of like Forrest Gump, where he he met every nearly every famous person during his time. Like he met Wyatt, Earp, he was friends with Wyatt Earp, he's friends with Teddy oh. Roosevelt, he's friends with W. C. Fields. He's considered the greatest boxing promoter of all time. He had yeah. mob ties, he had gambling ties. So he had such an interesting life. Where I think more people knew about it. It's like it'll be a perfect eight part like Netflix miniseries, you know. Right, and he also died on the same day. Uh... That uh, mom was born. Uh, my mother was born, January six, nineteen twenty-nine. So uh, yeah. you got something there too. Very good. good. As long as you got, as long as you have plans, you know that's that's good because, um, you know it's it's hard when, you know you have all this uh, creative energy but you don't know where to put it. You, you know you don't know how to channel it. So that's, for me, that's for me, it's, uh, finding the time, you know. Yeah, well, that too, you know. Um, I mean, I didn't really start writing in earnest until I retired. I mean, I was I was writing uh, sports stat and writing for InsideHockey.com and stuff, but I really didn't sit down and write a book until I retired, and I had a lot of time. And uh, that's that's what you need because you because you need to really get into it sometimes, you know. And you, um, uh, you should uh, also know when. It's not working for you. I mean, I was writing the Frank Boucher book that is on its way out now um, for about a year, and I was about halfway through, and it just wasn't going where I wanted it to go. All right, so I wrote a baseball book with uh, a friend, uh, uh, Ralph from from the network, and I, you know, I put the um, Frank Boucher book uh, aside, and then um, when when the baseball book was done. I went back to it, and, and I had renewed renewed uh, motivation for it, and um, I finished it up. So you have to know when to when to know that it's just not working right now. So you know. Yeah, if mine's not into it, it's not going to come out right. Yeah, yeah. So all right, let's let's uh, talk about the the uh, current ranges. You, you have any thoughts on Peter Laviolette? Not a fan. <laughs> I wouldn't have never fired Gallant. I thought it was a over, complete overreaction. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, this lateral. I, I'm calling him Peter Lateralette. Cause it's a, to me, it's a lateral move. It's just you can't fire the players, so you fire the coach. Yeah. Uh, you three years in Washington, that team got worse from their Stanley Cup run. And that's who they – oh, that's who we want to run the Rangers, who needs their Cup run. So I don't, I don't get it. It just, it just seems like a panic move to me. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I you know I I'm uh, uh, withholding my my uh, opinion about him, but uh, you know it's it's a it's you know he's he's uh, he's been in the league a long time, and it's it's almost like you know we hired someone who's who's um, you know like a retread. But um, there's not there's not been one coach in the salary cap era to win the Stanley Cup with two different teams. And knowing what and knowing Rangers history, do you really think it's gonna be the Rangers to break that trend? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean uh we were lucky to win in ninety four, so you no know, who and Peter Lobby let's not Mike Keenan. And uh, the Rangers don't have um the team that they had in ninety four. Uh do any of the um do any of the free agent signings uh get you excited? Not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going into oh, the season. I'm going into the season with no expectations. This way, I can't get let down. It could only be pleasantly surprised. But right. to me, it's right. like they went to a senior citizen home and just signed every everyone that the crap that they could find. I yeah. mean, when Jonathan Quick is your backup, the guy was the worst starting goal in the league last year before he lost his spot. It's just I don't know what they're doing. It's just I don't understand the salary cap and this. You know they're kind of stuck stuck with that, but there's nothing there. This, I thought I t- to me this summer's been one of the slowest summers in a long time. I don't, there's nothing really get juiced or jazzed up about to me. Yeah. I mean Blake Wheeler. There's a reason why they took the captaincy away from Winnipeg, and there's a reason why Winnipeg bought him out. 
he was playing well. They, you know, he'd still be there. He'd still have a seal in his chest. But to me, it's just like another – knowing your Rangers history just feels like, you know, a bunch of washed-up guys, the big names, yeah. and won't pass that prime. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know? You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, they got older and older and uh, slower while the rest of the league gets younger and faster. And, uh, you know, definitely. maybe they want to be tougher to play against in the playoffs, but you got to get there first. And, um, it doesn't matter. It see, to, it doesn't matter what they have. You can be as tough as, be as tough as you want, be as fast as you want, be whatever you want. But if you took top two guys turn into ghosts during the playoffs, it means nothing. If Panarin go, does nothing, Zed Banager does nothing again, then what's the point? It doesn't matter. So, and to me, that's how my, this, I feel this season is going to be a long exercise. I don't care what happens. As long as they make the playoffs, I don't care what happens. The only way this team will be judged is by what they do in the playoffs. And uh, that's why I think the regular season, I think, is just going to be uh, long to watch and just get me through the 82 games. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I think they need to get off to a quick uh, start in the regular season because, um, you know, having a new coach, there, there might, you know, there might be some uh, – some new line combos and, and things like that, and the players have to get used to maybe different systems. So they really have to have to um, try to get off to a good start because, you know, I think maybe the first 10, 15 games for uh, for uh, every team is like an extended uh, in the preseason because they're all trying out different things, uh, trying different players, trying to, um, to see who fits into what, uh, what peg. But... Um, these uh, these early season games, they're they they points that are going to count later on in the year, and they they got to grab them all they can. So uh, while everything you say is valid, at the same time they had a horrible start last year. They yeah. didn't they didn't turn the corner until right before Christmas. They still finished with the third place. They were challenging for first place there for a while towards the end. So to me, like I said, it's, I don't care if they finish first place when the President's Trophy, if they finish the second wild card. To me, it's whatever they do in the playoffs. Like, and you're going to hear the same usual talking points. You're going to hear the Thanksgiving tent pole, the New Year's record. The only thing that's going to matter from this season, in the regular season, is going to be the trade deadline because that's what the final team will be for the playoffs. And after that, let's see what they have. And like I said, I just – after these last couple of years, especially now where uh, both Laviolette and Drew have been saying, win now, win now, win now, we have to win the Stanley Cup, it's now and ever, you know. Because the win- I think their window is – I think the window closed – last year, and we'll see. Hopefully I'm wrong about that, but I don't know about this core right now. Yeah. Um, how many more chances do you think they're going to give uh, the GM, Chris uh, Drury? That's interesting. Uh, I think because they fired the head coach. Now he's on his set. Technically, he fired Quinn, even though, even though Quinn wasn't really under him. Right. He's technically the third coach because he did pass on Quinn, right? He fired Quinn and said, no, I'm going to go somewhere else. So this is his third coach, so I don't know. I think I think Dolan does worry about his legacy. I have no uh, evidence of that. It's just my feeling. Dolan's 70 years old now, and with the Knicks, uh, he has over 50 combined seasons out of championships. So you know you know he wants one. So I think he's going to be – it seems like Dolan's more involved in the Rangers than he ever was before. So uh, I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe uh, – I think your theory's right. I think – Jury might be uh, his seat's warming up a little bit, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I I I think he's safe as as long as uh um, you know Glenn Save is pulling the strings because Save did pick him, and it's going to be hard for them to to uh, get um, a legitimate uh, general manager in because every everybody knows they're going to be working for Save and uh, and you know he's and you know whoever they. They would bring in was going would be would be undermined by say that and it's just it's just going to be hard for them to, to bring in a um, a guy who who has you know won somewhere else before you know so. the only think of like the only again I'm not rooting for them to lose so I don't have high hopes for them but obviously I'm rooting for them to win no matter what but uh, I can see a scenario where say they don't they don't have a winning season and Dolan's always loves those big names and. Time has passed, and I could see him bringing in a Bowman and maybe Quenville a pair together. So I don't know, but that's just – I just wouldn't rule that out in case they had a bad season because Dolan loves, does love his big names. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, if if uh, you know Quinville would want to come here, because like I said, you'd, you'd be working for Sather, and you know, Sather has has a you know lousy a reputation around the league. You know, yeah, he won years and years and years ago, but you know what has he done lately? So well, yeah, won a cup in thirty three years, and uh, you know there's no Mark Messi around either. Right. Um. Any chance that there's going to be room for? The kids this year, like uh, Will Cooley or uh, Brennan Othman? I think it really depends on how their season goes. Uh, if the, you know, if they're playing bad, they're going to call them up because you might as well give them a look. But going into the season, I think Othman has to stay in the Wolf Pack. You give him some time because you don't really wait. Because right now, if you look at their roster, they're jammed with these one-year uh, old man contracts. Right. Pull Othman up. At best, he's on the fourth line right now. So I think he's better suited off in the AHL. Cooley, I think, just because he's more physical, you could call him up, and he's more of a fourth liner, you know, a natural fourth liner. But I think going into the season, they're going to go with the veterans, and uh, if something happens, and then I think you see him called up. And I think if you see him playing this season, I think it's a bad thing for them because they're trying to win now, and if they bring up young kids, then it's you know, it's, I think it tells you what you need to know. What about Kako and uh, Lafreniere? Lafreniere is still in sign, which... I know the contracts have gone late into summer before, but each day it gets more concerning. Like, it's August 23rd, as I say this to you right now, and he's still unsigned. Like, what's the holdup? You know, they have the yeah. money. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, he wants to be here. Why hasn't been done? And there's been no offer sheet either to him, so that kind of tells you something that no one was interested in even trying to steal him. Right, right. But I think they go – I think they start the season say, uh, assuming he resigns, which I think he – Will was again. I don't know what the holdup is. Uh, I think they start on the third line because again, I think they go with the veterans on the top six. Because everyone was saying play the kids, play the kids, but at the same time, uh, Laviolette and Drury are both maybe playing for their jobs too. So kind of like a lot last, you know, they're playing for your jobs. You're trying to win. These guys ain't producing. Yeah, how can you keep force feeding them time? This is not this is not David Quinn two point oh ever no more. You know. Right. Right. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a. a, a... Interesting season because uh, there's a lot on the line for a lot of a lot of people. I think um, people maybe put Chris Cry on the third line. Chris Cry is your top goal scorer the last two seasons. How do you do that? Yeah, you know, and he's in the prime. You know, if if maybe two seasons ago was the, I think it will be considered the prime of his career because I can't see him scoring fifty plus goals again. But even so, he's still playing at a high level. I just don't see how you bump Lafreniere and you're really going to bump Panarin. You know. Yeah, make a he's the highest paid winger in the league. I just can't see it happening. And Panarin's another one that's so polarizing. He's making all that money. He's a, he's a great regular season player, but whatever it is, once the uh, once it turns into spring, that's it. Poof. Yeah. Yeah. Last uh, spring was a real disappointment. I, uh, you know the, um, you know they 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 just folded. They just they just collapsed. I mean, they didn't even put up a fight. I mean, it's just just uh, embarrassing, and uh, it's a shame. But um, that's 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 how it ranges sometimes, you know. I, 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 you know, as far as, as you know, as far as I'm concerned, I go back pretty far. I can't really think of any time that they that they uh, they just collapse like that. They you, you know they they have been blown out games to zip in the past, but that's always to a to a much better team. Uh, you know, they 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 um, matched up on paper pretty good with uh, New Jersey, but of course the games played on ice were it's slippery. So, uh, but to me, I uh, think uh, 2015 was a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. You guys got the home games, games five and seven. You gave up those two touchdowns in games two and three. You know, if that was every time for Lundqvist and Dak ever to win the Cup, that was that year, you know. That, to me, was more – hey, this was bad, too. And I, the only – like I said, say, the only silver lining is that at least Boston – there was a bigger upset in the first round because look what happened – look at their offseason, all these retirements and people leaving there. So, Boston might not even make the playoffs next year. And Yeah, uh, that was a real, um, real, real surprise that they that they, they lost to Florida. So. Yeah. And if they get past Florida, they, who knows? Maybe they win the Stanley Cup. This, so it's so wacky, the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's why it's the best playoffs, because you never know what the heck's going to happen, you know? No. That's why they play them. 
So, um, who do you think? Um, um, how about Patrick Kane? Do you think he's he's going to be uh, in the mix somehow? Or yes, I think uh, from what well, from the reports out there, he's not going to be ready till uh, either December or early January. I think he stays on sign till then. I think he just looks to delay the land. What team has the best chance of winning the Stanley Cup, and that's who he signs with. Well, that's why he came to the Rangers because he thought he could win the Cup here. Right, and they bent and they made a mountain move for that, and look at how that turned out. But obviously, it wasn't 100. percent And again, the top two guys on that team didn't show up in the playoffs. Even true, but you know, captain didn't do much. So uh, you know, there's just there's just a failure of the playoffs. I, I wouldn't really put Kane, Kane was actually outscored uh, Panarin in most of them, and Tarasenko was better than everyone else besides Kreider. You know, yeah, that's, that that hurt. I wish I would have been able to find a way to keep Tarasenko. I'd have rather. Instead of all these one-year contracts they gave to all these 40-year-old guys, I would have given it to Tarasenko, especially when you see what he signed, only one year with uh, Ottawa, you know? Yeah, he was more of a, um, you know, a um, you know, the kind of player that the, that the Rangers needed. Um, but, um, you know, it just didn't work out, I guess. Um, how about Igor? You think he's going to have a good year this year? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't worry about him. He's the last person I worry about with him. You know, I think he'll be I just fine. Worry that he gets hurt. I, I, I just, I just worry that he gets hurt. I mean, I, I don't like the butterfly style of goaltending, and I, I just, I just think about their knees and and their 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 leg muscles, and I just, I just, I just cringe every time I see them dropping down like that. But um, I was down this, Jonathan Quick and carrying them, and I doubt Louis Domingue is. I was hoping yeah. um, I was hoping they'd bring Cam Talbot back over the summer because he only signed for uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars more with L.A. At least he know he could still start. He's not what he used to be, but he can still get. He still he can still do the minutes. Quick guy, yeah. I'm just nervous about him. He looked horrible last year. I watched a lot of the Kings and a lot of the Vegas games he played. He was just horrible, and I just don't. See, I see he's thirty eight now, and I just don't see how he turns back the clock. You know, so if, yeah. you better hope you don't get hurt. Or else they're, they're done. Yeah, Cam Talbot had a had a great a great run with the Rangers, especially when uh, Lundqvist got hurt. He 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 carried the team for a while. Yeah, I mean he had Talbot had injury issues last year in Ottawa, but before that he still serves with a goal. He could still start. He's like a one B now, but still like he could at least do, you don't have to worry about him. But Quick just worries me. Yeah. Well, we got to see. Uh, what happens? I mean, um, every every year we can go into to every season thinking about somebody worrying us and not wondering, you know, wondering what the Rangers are going to do. But um, you know, it's just it's just um, they got to play the games and see what happens. I wonder what happened with uh, Halak because Halak's still unsigned. I wonder why he didn't want to didn't want to come back. Yeah. Uh, that was a that was a, a surprise. He he played well. He he got off to a bad start, but yeah, once once he he uh, found his uh, his uh, groove, he he played pretty well for us. But yeah, um, the was slow to start. But if you look at it, he was still his, his goals allowed. His different percentage was still good. It's just they weren't scoring from him. He lost those first five six games. I think they were outscored something like nineteen to three or something. Yeah. So uh, I thought he was good for the whole year, and then. Uh, I just don't. I don't know. There's nothing. He hasn't said nothing. His agent Alan Walsh hasn't said nothing, and he's still unsigned. And he's got 295 career wins, so you know he's coming back because he wants to get to that 300 number. You know. Sure, sure. I think um, I think uh, Quick is a year younger than uh, than uh, Halak. I don't know. He might. He might be, but uh, he looked a lot worse. You can see. You got to realize Quick had a longer career, like you know. He's played long. He's had the deep playoff runs. He's been a starter. Halak's been a backup a lot recently. So, Quick's got more miles on him, you know? Yes, that's that's a good point. Yeah, I, I had it written down here that uh, Halak was, is uh, smaller and he's a year older than Quick. So, uh, I had made a note about that when they first got him. So, uh, who knows? Um, just as long as... Uh, as uh, Igor can play, 
that most of the games and um, get relief once in a while from quick. Because um, I don't want to wear them after the playoffs either, you know? Right, you can't worry, you know, you got to worry about the burnout because Halak started, I think, 26 games last year. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's down. That was the only issue. Do you think we'd get that many games that are quick? I'm, <laughs> like I said, I'm very nervous about that. <laughs> I could, I could see, uh, speaking of Talbot, I could see a Talbot situation with quick. I could see quick, like, um, when they had Marty Byron and he just had those horrible games to start and they're like, oh, no, the Byron shot. And they want to pull up Talbot, the fresh kid from Hartford. I can see that maybe happening quick. It uh, doesn't work out. And maybe they go for the Garan guy from Hartford or, some, or another kid from Hartford. Maybe, that, maybe that's the best uh, point. But we'll see. Yeah. Well, you know, Marty Biron, um, he retired. Um, I can't think of the guy's name. But the, it's one, one guy on, um, I think, this, the um, – one of the California teams, the Rangers were playing them, and he came in on on Biron, and he um, he made a, a a really a really funny move, like uh, between the legs move and everything, and he really made Biron look bad, and um, he retired after that. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but you know, he, he just after that he just said, "I'm I'm out of here." So the same thing happened a couple of years later with uh, Andres Pavlik, and then. Um... That's when they called Georgia right out of Hartford, fresh face Fookie. So maybe I can see that happening, you know, because it's happened twice yeah. recently. That's what I'm going by. Yeah. I always wanted Georgia had to do well because I wanted them to hear, hear the fans go, Georgie, Georgie. But uh, that never happened. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For some reason they don't like them. I, I always liked them. A lot of fans don't. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. yeah but they're, they're mad at him <laughs> since he wants to start. Anyone yeah. his age have that mentality. You don't go, you don't try to guess there and say, "Hey, I want to be a backup my whole life." See? And then look at him. I think he was a, statistically he was the third best goaltender in the NHL last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he had the most amount of wins, if I recall. He had forty-one wins, if I'm off the top of my head. But I think he had the most amount of wins last year, and he played well for them. Except you know, then they faltered in the playoffs. But they also were beat up. They, you know, they lost uh, the captain was gone all season. You know. Right. Yeah. Well. Um. All right, so you don't have a lot of expectations for the Rangers this year. No, and how, are you, are you more optimistic than I am? No, um, they're going to play eighty-two games, and they're going to win some, and they're going to lose some, and and um, it'll come down to the maybe it'll come down to the last couple of games of the season where they got to win or they lose, and they make the playoffs, and then um, um, who knows what's going to happen? So. I just, I, I, you know, after after last spring, it's just, it's just very, uh, very uh, depressing. It just, you know. When you look at the top, I mean, when you look at the top right. four teams that division from last season, every the, the three other teams got better. Carolina got better, the Devils got better, and Pittsburgh got better. Exactly. Yeah. So it concerns me a lot too. I think the Rangers got worse, and I, like you said, they got slow and older, and that doesn't win right now in the Stanley Cup playoffs. No, no. Um, no, you mentioned Pittsburgh. I wanted Mike Sullivan to coach the Rangers. I wanted, I wanted uh, the guy from uh, Toronto, the uh, GM that came that, that came down to become coach uh, to, to be GM for Pittsburgh. I wanted him to bring the coach with him, and so Mike Sullivan would be out of a job, and he'd come to the Rangers. That's what I wanted, but I think- that didn't happen. I think that's always the Larry Brooks pipe dream. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Because why would yeah. Pittsburgh? But one, Mike Self is new contract that hasn't even gone into effect yet. His renewal goes into effect with the 24-25 season. So why would they pay Mike Sullivan all this money to go coach a rival? Which that never made sense to me. I, I know Larry Brooks was trying to pitch that and hammer that, and try to make it willing to existence. But that, that was I, I never thought that was going to ever happen. Yeah. Well, you know, we can hope. Um, you know. There's, 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 um, you know, Ranger fans are are, are full of hope, you know. <laughs> yeah, they give you a lot of things to be hopeful about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least they least bring uh, Brian Trottier back. Huh. Now, well, you know, that that whole thing is 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 you know silly too because you know supposedly as you said in your book he wrote a, he he hand he hand writ uh, wrote a a 90-page 
um, you know, letter to Sailor about, uh, you know, I guess how he's going to, you know, turn the reins around. Um, don't you have anybody in your family with a with a computer or a typewriter who you can who you can, um, you know, have type this for you, handwritten, really? Um, it's just, you know, and you know, this is in the 20th century, you know. Um, I, I, you know, you know that that whole thing blows my mind. But um, I guess uh, Sayla was impressed. I guess he liked his handwriting. I don't know. Just but, imagine uh, the letter on a inside of a cave, like a caveman in the walls. The say that gave him a <laughs> say that gave him a hundred contracts. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hieroglyphics. It's amazing how bad. Say this been and how loyal Dolan is to him. Yeah, well, uh, um, I had heard somebody, somebody, somebody told me that Sayla was going to retire, you know, for good. But why um, would he? Why would he? It's, it's easy money. Yeah, yeah. But my my feeling was that as long as she has a phone, we're in trouble because even if he does retire and never comes back to New York, he can still call Dolan. You know. Yeah. So, Dolan. Um, and you know Dolan will, will do whatever he says because Dolan's Dolan. So the most you don't have to call Dolan a name; you just call him by his own name, Dolan. You know, so uh, so hey, it's just it's just um, any idea who who uh, you would say might win the cup this year? Who's your favorite? I'm gonna go off the board a little bit because I think everyone has. I don't know if everyone has Vegas repeating, but I think everyone has like Carolina and the Devils coming out of the Metro. I'm going to go with the Penguins. Really? I feel, I feel uh, as we're seeing what Vegas just did, everyone's going all in. They're not worried about the future. If we can win the Cup, going all in. And that's what this Carlson deal is. They're going all in because that contract's going to be horrible in the next three years after it. And they have a lot of old guys on that team, but they have guys who are accomplished players. I think they're going to go nuts at the trade deadline because they know it's this, this is their year to go all in. If it doesn't happen now, then I don't, I don't think this core ever win again with Crosby, Latang, and uh, Malcolm there. So mm, I, think, right. I, yeah. I think they're going to go, go all in, trips to the table. And the Toronto Maple Leafs kind of have a history like us, uh, you know, post-1967. So uh, wouldn't it be so – wouldn't it be it's just a stick in their craw for for Pittsburgh to win the Stanley Cup when Dubas goes there right away? So I don't know. I just I just can't bet against Crosby, and I just have a funny feeling that they're gonna go nuts signing everybody. They're gonna mortgage their future. They're going they're going for it this year. Yeah, well, you know, it makes sense. Like you said, their, their last shot, and um, you know, last last um, last shot at the prize. So they 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 might do it. Who, who knows? Who do you like? Um, I think Carolina might uh, might win, but um, yeah, Carolina's I'm amazing. not I'm not uh, I'm not betting any money on it. So, or, and I you know I would like I would like anybody but New Jersey and the Islanders basically. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to see them win, but uh, I think Lamorello is going to do what he can to to, to boost the uh, the Islanders up, and. Um, I think they they're probably going to have a better season than we do this year. So yeah, uh, I'll just fall off. I don't think they're making the playoffs either. Yeah. Yeah. I I see. Obviously, I see the Devils making the playoffs, and who knows with them? You know. Well, I'll see. You got to play the games. That's well. it. But I think Jack Hughes took a major step, and we'll see if Akira Schmidt's the real deal because it would be so Ranger for him to never have a good game in his life because that's the way it works with the Rangers, but. Uh, we'll see who the who the goalie is over there. So if it, Schmidt has legs, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about Philadelphia? Oh, dead last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think uh, Torts is going to be one of the first coaches fired this year. See, the thing with Torts is they're already paying Elaine Vigneault for five. What is it? Five point five million a year not to coach them. So okay. you're going to. Get a fire. I think Torch is making five million. So, say fire Torch, that means you're going to be paying over ten million dollars in coaching. And then you're going to be hiring a third coach. It's obvious that Torch is the wrong guy for that team right now for a rebuilding team. Yeah. yeah. So, 
I with all the money, can are they really can they afford to pay all this money for coaches not to coach there? I don't. He seems Torch seems like he's uh, willing to be there for the rebuild. He seems to be on good terms with uh, Keith Jones over there. So we'll see, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Torch is you know the kind of guy that you bring in to, to bring the team over the hump. I mean, uh, I think uh, I think Philadelphia needs a guy like Roger Nielsen was with the Rangers, who you you you, you know take a young team and. Uh, you know, guide them along, but can only get them so far. And then Smith had to bring in Keenan, and um, and um, you know, Torts is that kind of of, of a coach who, who who can take a team to the next level that uh, someone like uh, Nielsen couldn't. But uh, you imagine if Torts was coaching these Rangers today? What? You imagine if Torts was coaching these Rangers today? Yeah, I would love to see what he'd have to say to Panarin. Yeah, that would be um, that would be interesting. I would like to um, I would like to see him bench some of the guys from last year. So, uh, uh, you know, that that would have been nice. But uh, I think Lavi doesn't have a very tough job this season. I don't think he's, I, I just I think a lot of headaches for him coming up. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a long season, and um, we'll see what happens. Maybe you have a lot of time to write your next book. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope not, you know. Yeah. Uh, when Sam Rosen said this one's going to be a last, last live time, I didn't, I didn't take him literally, and now I feel like it is a literal statement. Yeah, yeah well, you know, it it will last my lifetime probably. So, uh, uh, but uh, okay. yours, you know, you, you, you know, you have a lot of years on me, so... Uh, Oh, speaking of which, did you send Steve uh, Valaket a uh, birthday card? I sent him a pajama gram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I guess it slipped my mind to give him something for his birthday. Okay. I saw his birthday uh, was one day last, last week, and I was, oh, Sean, Sean, probably um, giving him a hell. So, what do you what get the man who deserves nothing? <laughs> yeah. But it has funny that he shares a birthday with Chris Jury too. Really? Yeah, oh. Chris Jury turned forty-seven on August twentieth. Hmm. And I thought he'd get laughing his contract done for his birthday, but not so much. Yeah, I think Sam Rosen's birthday was last one day last week too. Right? What did he just turn? Seventy-six, seventy-seven. I think it's seventy-seven. Yeah. So he's got. Right. I think yeah. it's about time that you uh. Get rid of that booth and promote Kenny Albert and um, Dave Maloney to TV. Yeah, you know Sam's kind of losing it lately. I think you know I, I know he's an institution and all, but uh, I think he's. I think people. He's kind of like a senile grandfather now. For people, people just laugh at his mistakes, and he's no longer what he once was. Obviously, you know. Well, I remember when um, when Sam took over for uh, Jim Gordon, and uh, that was a that's a real shock to everybody. But we've and that was uh, that was during Espo's um, era as GM, so that was quite a few years ago. But uh, we lived oh, through it. Uh, oh. Rose and Cole games with Espo before he became GM. Yeah, that, that's, that's right, yeah. And, then, okay. then Espo, and that's when John Davidson came in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I believe Gordon uh-huh. Espo came first, and then it was Sam for that one seat. What, what was it, uh, 80-45? And then uh, Espo took over his GM eighty five, eighty six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you got any final thoughts before we close this up? <laughs> Sorry to sound so down about the Rangers, but after writing a Ranger killer book, all these negative memories in your head, and I just I think that I don't know. I'm forty one years old, and it's been a lot of bad seasons for the Rangers, but this two thousand twenty three playoffs, for whatever reason, just hit me harder than the rest of it. Even the two thousand fifteen loss. I just don't see how they got any better, and I think everyone has got – I don't know. I just think it's going to be long, long, long. And then you look at the other teams in New York between the baseball teams and everything else, it just feels like we're just resigned to losing all of a sudden, you know? Yeah, it's a bad time for um, New York sports teams. And um, you have to point to the people in charge and um, blame them, you know? So uh, – and we've certainly done that 
uh, enough with the Rangers. So, but they, you know, I, 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 I uh, have, um, you know, uh, mentioned this before on the podcast that I've been watching these guys for more than sixty years now, and they never ever call me up and ask me what they should do. <laughs> so, 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 you know, hey, listen. It's your team. You you do what you want, and you know, hopefully uh, things will come out um, okay. That's what but we can hope for. Okay. <laughs> but this way, if they called you, I'm sure in your 60 years you could win it one or as more than more than one cup with your thing. Look at them, what they've been doing for these last uh, 83 years. You know. Yeah. It's just ah, oh, it's just it's not easy being a Ranger fan. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. But we're still watching, and we're still, you know, we still love them. Yeah, yeah. You know, who knows? They might surprise us. That's what that's that I is, said. Last, this last two years, I was very optimistic, very positive about them. I thought I had high hopes for them. I thought they'd really, I really thought they'd win the Stanley Cup these last two years, and whatever, whatever happened didn't happen. This year, I'm just going to go with the. Uh, I don't want to say be negative or pessimistic. I'm just going to have no expectations this way. I could only be uh, surprised. You know, can't get let down. Yeah. You know, I don't think anything good's going to happen, but it might. So, we'll see. Well, let's hope so. so. All right, Sean, thank you very much for coming on. But that's I appreciate you. it. Pleasure. Um, hope you enjoyed it, too. We'll have you back sometime, maybe after your next book or before then. And um, uh, I'll be talking to you online, okay. emails, whatever. All right. Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. No, no problem, Sean. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.